Welcome. My name is Jeff Wyma, and I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. And perhaps in the previous videos, you and I have been thinking about uh, this important passage from the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And now in this next segment, I would like to preach a sermon on this passage. And the goal of this is to illustrate for you how one moves from the then and there of the text to the here and now of today on the kind of exegetical and hermeneutical moves one ought to make when you go from the study, the exegesis of the passage to the pulpit or perhaps the classroom where you preach or teach a passage. So the title of the sermon is also the title from our exegesis, namely Jesus is coming again. And before we read and reflect on this passage, I'd like to have an opening prayer of illumination. And I do that because of what the scripture says about the Holy Spirit's work of illuminating our hearts and our minds so that we can hear and heed the word of God. For example, John 14, 26, Jesus says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. A couple of chapters later, also as part of Jesus' upper room discourse, chapter 16, verse 13 in John, we read, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He not only is identified as the Spirit of truth, but he guides or leads Jesus' followers into all the truth. And the Apostle Paul also knows of how crucial the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit is. He says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So with those texts in mind, let us bow our heads in a prayer for illumination. Great and almighty God, we thank you for your word and the way that you in it revealed to us who you are and what you've done for us in Christ. Now, as we open that word, we pray that your spirit may be present, that all thoughts of worry or distraction may be removed, and that the spirit will allow us to hear your voice. And so, O oh God, fill us with your spirit through the reading and proclamation of your word this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture passage again is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and the text reads as follows. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that Jesus that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. In 1983, John Fisher was a classmate of mine at Calvin Theological Seminary. But before John Fisher felt a call to ministry and went to Calvin to pursue that call, he was instead going to be an engineer. And he was studying engineering at John Brown University in Arkansas. I don't know if you're familiar with John Brown University, but it's a Christian college. And more particularly, it's a Christian college which emphasizes in particular eschatology or the study of the end times. In fact, all students at the beginning of the year were required to take a crash course in the Bible. And a crash course in the Bible at John Brown University in those days was not a crash course in the Bible as a whole, but much more specifically, what does the Bible say about the end times? So as a result of this intensive course at the beginning of the school year, the students' minds were very much filled with these end time matters. 
John Fisher, however, was not having his mind filled with these end time matters. He was filling his mind with what all young male college students are thinking about all too often, and that is young female college students. And he and his two engineering buddies decided to play a prank on the women students. They took an electronic horn, connected it up to a timer, and then put it in a box which could not easily be figured out how to turn on or off, and then they set it to go off at midnight and placed the box outside the women's dorm to go off at midnight. And so they placed this box outside the, the women's dorms, and they sat in the bushes, hee, 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 waiting to hear what would happen. However, there was a fatal flaw in their prank. They failed to recognize an electronic horn sounds suspiciously like an instrument, namely a trumpet. And every Bible student with his or her salt knows that when Jesus comes, it's going to be accompanied by the sound of a trumpet. Well, at midnight, the device went off, and guess what happened? Well, over half, over half of the women students came running outside in their pajamas and their nightgown. In fact, they were jumping in the air saying, I'm coming, Jesus, I'm coming. And what's more, many of them had tears in their eyes because from their point of view, they weren't being raptured, but they were being left behind. Now, Perhaps you're laughing as you hear about the story, and I don't fault you. I did the same thing, too, when John told me that story so many years ago. But I've thought a lot about those women's students in the past years, and I've come to the sobering realization that these women students were actually more biblical in many ways than I was. Now, I don't agree that they had it right in terms of how Jesus would come back. We'll maybe talk about that later on in this message, but they got more the more important thing right, and that is this, namely that Jesus is going to come back. And this passage, if it does anything else, should remind you and me of this important truth of Scripture, namely the certainty of Jesus' return. And now we're called upon, like those women students, to be living lives of anticipation and preparation of that great and glorious day. Sadly, at that time, I was not like that. It was just a teaching that was in my head. It was just a confession I said when I recited the Apostles' Creed, but it wasn't part of my faith, my day-to-day existence. Those women students instead were, were more biblical than me, I believe, Because it wasn't just a teaching, it wasn't just a confession, it was a truth, a spiritual truth. They lived with a sense of excitement and anticipation for the great and glorious day of Jesus' return. The Christians in Thessaloniki, though, they uh, did not have to be reminded about the certainty of Jesus' return. They were already sure about that. That's because when Paul visited them on his second missionary journey for three plus Sabbaths, He preached to them Jesus. He preached to them Jesus incarnate. He preached to them Jesus during his earthly ministry, his teaching and his life. He preached to them Jesus crucified, Jesus resurrected, Jesus ascended, and also Jesus one day returning. And as a result of Paul's preaching, the Christians in Thessaloniki were eagerly anticipating Jesus' glorious return. They were eagerly anticipating the day when their faith would be proven right, despite the opposition and objections of their non-Christians who lived around them. But then something happened which caused them to become confused. Some of the Christians in that church, our text says, fell asleep Now, when Paul says they fell asleep, he doesn't mean that they were Christians in the church who during a boring sermon knocked off and went... No, he's using the word fell asleep here in a more metaphorical or symbolic way. A metaphorical or symbolic way to refer to death. That's not surprising. Even today, we don't like to refer to death as death. It sounds too harsh for us. We use euphemisms, more softer, user-friendly ways to refer to death. We talk about people who have, well, biblically fallen asleep, people who have, people who have passed away, people who are gone to be in glory. That's true even in the, in the secular world. Uh, none of us are comfortable with the language of death. 
Someone once joked about the obituary column in the newspaper. There might be 10 people listed in the obituary column, but only three of them have died. The other seven have gone to be with glory, gone to be with the Lord, or in a better place, or something like that. And so what Paul is dealing with here when he refers to those who have fallen asleep in our text, he's referring to Christians in Thessaloniki who have died. And this confused the Christians there. They worry now about the fate of their deceased loved ones. Would they not participate in the glory of Jesus' return? Would they somehow miss out on that day that they were so much looking forward to and anticipating? Or would they somehow be at a disadvantage compared to them, that is, the Christians who are alive at Jesus' return? And so in response to this confusion, Paul starts off with an important claim. He says to them, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant, that is, we don't want you to be confused or to not know about those who fall asleep, or to what? To grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul doesn't want them to be confused about the way that they're grieving. Or to put it differently, Paul says there's a difference between the way you Christians in Thessaloniki should grieve and the way non-Christians in your city should grieve. Now, we have to be careful here not to make a mistake. Many Christians do. Many people hear these words of Paul and they say, oh, that's the difference between Christians and non-Christians. Non-Christians go boo-hoo, apparently, in the context of death. They grieve, but Christians, well, they don't go boo-hoo. They might even go, hallelujah, praise the Lord. This person is in a better place by far. This person is with the Lord, which is gain. However, there is something fundamentally problematic about this kind of distinction. It's not only not true to what Paul is talking about, but it is pastorally problematic. In other words, There are many Christians, perhaps you're one of them, who think that Christians aren't allowed to grieve. That those who grieve somehow are those who are poor believers. I remember very well a a visit, a pastoral visit I made in my earlier days when I was pastoring uh, a congregation. I went to visit Mrs. Vandenberg, and Mrs. Vandenberg's husband had passed away about three weeks before, and so I was going there just as a kind of a follow-up encouraging visit, and As I was speaking with her, somewhere along the conversation, she caught me off guard. She said, Pastor Jeff, she said, God must be disappointed with me. And I was shocked. I said, you know, here's this dear Christian lady. You know, how could God possibly be disappointed with you? I said, and she said, this is her husband. She about her husband. She said, I know that I know that Martin is in a better place. I know that I should be happy for him. But, you know, I just miss him so much. You see what was going on? Not only was she grieving over her husband who had fallen asleep, who had died, but she was feeling guilty about grieving. She somehow thought it was inappropriate for her to grieve even in the context of death. And so it's important for us this morning to hear what the whole scriptures say about death and the proper response to death. We need to remember that God didn't create us to die. That's not God's purpose for humanity. That's actually a consequence of the fall and of sin. We need to remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 about death. He says it's the last what? It's the last enemy. Death is not a friend of Christians. It's an enemy. And we, of course, need to remember Jesus and his response to death, especially the death of not only his own life, He didn't welcome that. He said, Lord, please may this cup pass over me, but also the death of his dear friend, Lazarus. The scriptures are quite clear. It says in a very powerful way, he wept. And then I love what the Bible says in the very next words. The crowd said, see how he loved the man. The crowd didn't say, oh, look at the poor faith or weak faith that Jesus had. No, it showed that Jesus really loved Lazarus and he grieved over his death. And so it's important for you to hear me say this today. Tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. I'm going to say that again because it's so, so important for you to hear and to live out. Tears in the face of death is not a sign of weak faith, but of great love. 
There is nothing wrong with grieving over the loss of a loved one. Indeed, there is much to commend it. Paul commands us elsewhere to weep with those who weep. And when we do, it just means that we really, really love this person. And the last enemy has struck. Well, if that's not what Paul is saying, if that's not the difference between Christians and non-Christians, what is the difference? I'm going to read to you again that key verse, verse 13. Paul says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant, to be confused about those who fall asleep, those who have died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Ah, that's the difference. That's the all-crucial difference between believers and non-believers. Yes, non-Christians grieve, and yes, Christians grieve. But the big difference is, Christians grieve with hope. Even in the midst of our tears over the loss of a loved one who has died, we have hope. That's a powerful claim, Paul. What is this hope? What gives you the right to make this claim? Well, Paul says, I'm glad that you ask, right? Let me clarify for you some reasons why we have hope. Hope for our deceased loved ones when Jesus returns again, and also hope for us who are alive on that great and glorious day. Now, Paul actually gives two reasons why Christians can grieve with hope. One has to do with what Jesus has done. The other has to do with what Jesus has said. Let's begin first where Paul does with what Jesus has done. That's verse 14. Paul writes, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. What is it that Jesus has done, or more accurately, what God has done through Jesus? Well, Jesus has been raised from the dead. And this is also important in Paul's thinking, because Jesus' resurrection is a guarantee of believers' resurrection. You have one, you have the other. You don't have one, you don't have the other. Well, this is why Paul says what he says, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 15. There, in the great resurrection chapter of the Bible, Paul says that if Jesus has not been raised, well, then we're of all people most to be pitied. Why, we're just kind of blowing smoke. We're just uttering hot air with all of our preaching and our teaching. But of course, Paul can't stop there. As soon as he entertains the possibility that Christ hasn't been raised, he blurts out, but Christ has been raised. And then he says, the first fruits of our resurrection. That's a wonderful picture that Paul paints. A wonderful picture that we need to hear today. today. Namely, that Jesus' resurrection is a first fruit, a guarantee of our resurrection. Well, you don't look so excited about that. Maybe that's because you don't appreciate the power of this farming or gardening metaphor that Paul paints. Farmers and gardeners get really excited about the first fruit, the very first ear of corn that they could hold in their hand or the very first grape that ripens on the vine and they can pop into their mouth. Why are they excited? Well, because as real as that ear of corn is in their hand and as real as that grape is that they can pop in their mouth, That's how real the rest of the harvest will be. And now Paul, in a similar way, says to the Corinthians, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. It's almost like he says, you there in Thessalonica, put your hands up, all you who believe that Jesus rose again. And everybody puts their hand up. Everybody in Thessaloniki has heard the gospel story from Paul's preaching that Jesus died and by God's power was raised from the grave. And then Paul says, well, As real as you believe that Jesus rose again, that's how real you can be sure that your deceased loved ones will rise again. And if they're going to rise again, that means that they'll be there when Jesus comes again. That means that they won't be at a disadvantage. They won't miss out. They're going to share equally with those who are alive at Jesus' return the glory and splendor of that incredible day. That's the first reason why you and I can grieve with hope. Because Jesus' resurrection is a guarantee of our and our deceased loved one's resurrection. But Paul's got a second reason why we can grieve with hope. 
And this one is not based on what Jesus has done, but on what Jesus has said. Notice what Paul says in verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Paul has received a word of the Lord, and the Lord for Paul is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not God the Father, not the Holy Spirit, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are lots of questions that immediately we could ask. We could ask, one, where did Paul get this word of the Lord? Or two, what in the following verses is the word of the Lord? But it's really this third question, I think, that is the most important for one for us to ask and answer. And that is, why does Paul quote the word of the Lord? Why does Paul tell his readers that he has a word of the Lord? Well, the answer, I think, is quite clear. The answer is it adds authority to what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying, like we so often do today, I just feel, or it seems to me. Paul is not just giving them his opinion, his reflections on a matter. No, he says, I have an authoritative teaching that comes directly from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And what is this authoritative teaching that comes from Jesus? Well, as the rest of the verse goes on to say, it's that we who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. You see what Paul is doing, don't you? He's thinking about the Thessalonians and their problem. He's thinking about how they're grieving over their loved ones who have died, who have already fallen asleep. And here Paul reassures them from the words of Jesus Christ himself that we who are living will not be ahead of them who have already died. In other words, we who are living will in no way be in an advantage. Or to say it differently, those who have already died will share fully and equally in the glory of Jesus' return. And that's a second powerful reason why we can grieve, but wait a minute, more importantly, we grieve with hope. Now Paul does something else with this word of the Lord that is of importance In verses 16 and 17, he actually gives what I think is the clearest description anywhere in the Bible of how Jesus will come again. And there are many Christians, of course, who are quite interested in these verses because, again, all of us are interested in this end time scenario. What will happen when Jesus returns in glory? And I'm a little bit nervous about talking about verses 16 and 17, frankly, Because I'm worried that, like many Christians today, you're going to do something. You're going to forget about Pastor Paul in this passage. Pastor Paul, who is first and foremost trying to comfort these grieving Christians in Thessaloniki. And you're going to latch on to predicting Paul instead. You're going to get so excited, you'll say, Oh, now I'm going to finally hear what's going to happen in the end times. And even though I'm nervous about talking about these verses, I want to do so. Not only because they're obviously part of God's word, but there's a lot of confusion in today's church about these end time events. And so since our passage talks about them, let's take a moment or two to hear what the scriptures do say about how Jesus will come. So we first look at verse 16 and we hear this, for the Lord himself will come. That's important. The end of time will not be ushered in by an angel or by some other human being. No, it is the Lord Jesus Christ whose coming we look forward to and anticipate. And how will he come? He will come down from heaven, one, with a loud command, two, with the voice of the archangel, and three, with the trumpet call of God. Now, there are some Christians, they are brothers and sisters, they are fellow believers in Christ, But they have a different view, I think, than I do, and I think that the Bible does, about how Jesus will return. They argue that there will not be a one return of Jesus, but there will be a twofold return of Jesus. First, there'll be a secret coming in which Christians will vanish and disappear. Perhaps you've heard of the Left Behind series. Well, many people have. They've sold many, many millions of copies. But the Left Behind series opens with exactly this happening, the so-called rapture. 
the pilot is flirting, even though he's married with a stewardess, and then she comes back to him and says, they're gone. Who's gone? Well, people are gone. They've just vanished and disappeared. You see, this is a very common belief by many Christians today that Jesus will have a secret coming in which all Christians will just vanish and disappear. They'll go to heaven for seven years. During the seven years, you have the tribulation. A lot of bad things occur. And then after those seven years, Jesus comes not for his saints, but with his saints and begins his millennial or thousand year reign on earth. But I'm afraid that idea isn't really supported by this verse. Again, I share with you with what the Bible says. It says that the Lord himself will come how? With the voice of the archangel and with a loud command and with the trumpet call of God. First of all, that loud command. That loud command was given by people in that day. People, for instance, who would be a general in an army and they would say, charge! Or a captain of a ship who would tell people to row in a tense time of battle or a difficult storm. So these words always have the sense of a loud, authoritative cry. Our text also talks about the voice of an archangel. I've never heard the voice of an archangel, but I have a sneaky suspicion that if an archangel spoke and wanted to be heard, I would hear it. And the last one is a trumpet. Now, uh... One of my children, my youngest son, plays a trumpet, and I can assure you that a trumpet is not a soft or quiet instrument. A trumpet, even a single trumpet, is loud. And so when you put these three things together, a straightforward reading of this verse is that Jesus' return will be a public return, a public return of such glory and magnitude that all people, not only Christians but non-Christians, will hear, will witness, will experience. That's verse 16. But what does verse 17 say? After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here we have, I think, the only verse in the Bible that explicitly talks, if not about a rapture, but about the idea of a rapture, the idea of meeting the Lord. But a careful study of this verse shows that Our dispensationalist brothers and sisters, I think, have it wrong here again. You see, that word meet is a special word. In English, of course, it doesn't sound so important. Maybe you're going to meet someone today or you've got a meeting this week. It doesn't sound very exciting or positive. But the word in Greek to meet is apontasis. It's a special word that always has a special meaning. And it always has this special meaning Outside of the Bible, just like it has the special meaning inside of the Bible. And what is this special meaning? Well, in that day, if a big, important person were coming to your city, whether it was the governor, whether it was the general of the army, whether it was maybe even the emperor himself, well, what would happen? Well, the city leaders would get together and they would form a reception party, a delegation party. Who would be in this party? Well, obviously, it would be the people of power and influence. This would be a privileged position. They would put on their finest clothes, usually white. The people in the city would be waiting for them. The city would be cleaned up and garland would be, would be strewn all about. And this delegation party would go down the road to meet this important person. And then what would happen when the delegation party meets this important person? Do they go with that important person back to that important person's home, city, or dwelling? Of course not. They escort this person the rest of their journey to the place they were always going to go, the place from which the delegation party came. The image is very clear in the ancient world. It was a big event, and the Christians in Thessaloniki would have seen it many times when a governor or a general, or on a rare occasion, the emperor himself would come and there would be a delegation party to meet and then escort the person the rest of the way to the city. Well, this special meaning is always found outside of the Bible, and importantly, it's always found inside of the Bible too. This word, apontasis, to meet, occurs two other times in the New Testament. One is in Acts 28 when Paul is arriving to Rome. And the, this is on his prison journey. And the Christians in Rome hear that Paul is coming. Paul is coming. And so they send a group of Christians down the road to meet the apostle. 
And what happens when they meet Paul? Do they escape with him? Do they run away with him? Of course not. They escort him the rest of the way to Rome, the place to which he was going, the place from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. The other occurrence is in Matthew 25, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. We read that the virgins go down the road to meet, same Greek word, apontasis, the bridegroom. And when they meet him, what happens? Do they take off with him on the honeymoon? Of course not. The wedding hasn't even happened yet. They escort him to the place he was going, the wedding and the banquet, the place from which they originally came. And so when we now come to this verse, this all crucial verse 17, which has that special meaning of the word always outside of the Bible and always inside the Bible and its two other occurrences, it seems to me the clear interpretation of verse 17 is exactly the same. That Paul paints a picture, and that's what it is. It's a metaphor, a picture for his readers of what happens when Jesus comes. On that great day, they, that is the Christians, will be in the privileged position. They'll get to be in the important position of going down the road, or in this case, going in the air to meet the Lord. And then what happens when they meet the Lord? Does Jesus do a U-turn and go back to heaven for seven years, as again our brothers and sisters in the dispensational or left-behind camp suggest? Well, the answer can't be that. The word never means that. It never means that outside of the Bible. It never means it inside of the Bible in its two other occurrences. Instead, the picture is a, is a wonderful one. The picture is once we meet the descending, reigning Christ, we escort him to the place he is going, namely earth, the place from which we, the members of the delegation party, came. And once that happens, Paul simply says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. It would have been nice if Paul had, had gone on to talk about the final judgment and all things being made new and life with Jesus and God on a glorified and perfected earth. But for Paul, he says simply, we will be with the Lord. And that's another reason why the Christians in Thessaloniki can grieve with hope. Now, I'm, I'm really nervous now. Because I've been going on for maybe too long about verses 16 and 17. I've been giving you lots of technical details about how Jesus will come back. And as a result, I'm a little bit worried that you may have forgotten the Thessalonians. You may have got caught up with all these end time events that you may have forgotten that they're grieving. They're grieving over the loss of brothers and sisters who have died before Jesus comes back. I may, I'm worried that you may have forgotten that it really is Pastor Paul talking here. And so that's why we need to, to bring it home in verse 18, as Paul does, and remind us of the comfort of Jesus' returns. Paul ends by saying, Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Or as other translations have it, I like that better. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In other words, be comforted by the fact that our deceased loved ones who now are not only with the Lord, which is gain, which is better by far, will also be resurrected when Jesus comes again and therefore will share fully and equally with us in the glory of Jesus' return. And I know that these are words of comfort not only for the Thessalonians, I know they're also words of comfort for you. I'm sure that you are thinking in today's passage about somebody whom you love who has fallen asleep. I mean, it might be a mom or dad. It might be a grandparent. Uh, it might be a spouse or, well, it might even be as unfortunately it is in my situation. It might even be a child. You see, my wife and I have four living children, but we have a fifth child too. Our second child was a boy and when he was two months old, he died of crib death, otherwise known as sudden infant death syndrome. That's our son, David. And I remember he was under the care of someone else that evening. And my wife and I were out and we came back to pick up our son. And the horror on my wife's face as she held out for me our son. And I remember feeling the cold, clammy skin of our beloved baby and the panic that we experienced as we waited for the ambulance to come and their inability to revive him. And so my wife and I cried. 
it was appropriate for us to cry because this was a loss. The enemy had struck, and so we grieved. But in the middle of our grieving, we grieve not like the rest of men who have no hope. We grieved with hope. Hope for our son, who was now with the Lord, which again is gain, which is better by far. Hope that nothing can separate him from the love of God that is his in Christ Jesus, not even death. But also the hope that he would be with us again when Jesus returns in glory. And so, dear friends, I know that these words of comfort are not only words of comfort for the Thessalonians who are grieving over the loss of their loved ones. They can be words of comfort for you as you think about the loss of someone who is near and dear to you. But, you know, these are not only words of comfort. They are also words of challenge. You just can't go to anybody on the street and say, hey, listen to me, I've got some words of comfort for you. Because if you read just anybody on the street these words, well, if they're a Christian, yes, they're words of comfort. They reassure us that Jesus is coming back and that we, along with our deceased loved ones, will be with Jesus when he returns. But if you're not a Christian, well, these aren't words of comfort, but these are words of judgment. Because they'll remind some of a day they don't want to think about, a day when Jesus returns, yes, in glory to, to what? To judge the living and the dead. There's an old hymn that speaks about it being a day of wonders, but also a day of judgment. And so that raises the question of this passage for you now. Is Jesus' return a day of comfort or is it a day of judgment? Now, for me, it's a day of comfort. And you say, of course it is. You're a minister. You're not only a minister, you're a seminary professor. Of course, you're comforted by this text. Well, I want you to know that this is a comfort text for me, or to put it differently, I know that I'll be with Jesus when he comes again in glory, not because I'm a minister. I'll be with Jesus, and this passage is comforting for me, not because I'm a seminary professor. And this passage is not comforting for me just because, you know, I'm a nice guy and I do good things. And this passage is not a comfort to me because, well, my parents were Christians and I somehow grew up in a Christian home. Now, the reason that this is a word of comfort for me, the reason that I have hope, even through tears in the context of death, is because I know that I belong body and soul and life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that Jesus has died for me and paid for all my sins so that I can be reconciled to God, so that I have the gift of forgiveness and the outpouring of his spirit as one of the new covenant blessings that Jesus during his earthly ministry ushered in. And if that's your confession too, then these are indeed words of comfort. And then you can pray the last prayer of the Bible and you can pray with all true conviction. You can pray, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, a word which we believe is every bit as true for the Christians in Thessaloniki as it is for the believers today. And we pray now that your spirit, the same spirit that inspired Paul to write those words, will now work in our hearts and our minds so that we'll heed these words. O oh God, we desire to experience the comfort that comes from belonging to Jesus and knowing that he has paid for all our sins. We ask that you will impress this gospel truth into our hearts so that we may be comforted, not only in the loss of loved ones, but also as we face our own potential mortality. O oh God, reassure us of the comfort that is ours, that comes from belonging to Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.